French philosophers and their ideas which influenced the framers, Charles de Montesquieu and Jean-Jacques Rousseau. This is for Georgia Standards SSCG2, demonstrate knowledge of the political philosophies that shape the development of the United States constitutional government. Part B, analyze the impact of the writings of Hobbes, Locke, Rousseau, and Montesquieu. In this content module, we will study Montesquieu and Rousseau. we look at the timeline, we notice both Montesquieu and Rousseau were published just before the American Revolution and significantly after Thomas Hobbes. During the 17th century, France was at the zenith of its power on the European continent, and while England was preoccupied with internal disruption. By the 18th century, France moved to become a worldwide power through its colonies, England still remained the dominant naval power, but France possessed a superior army and had greater cultural influence throughout Europe by the 1750s. This worldwide competition between French and British empires culminated in a worldwide war between these two powers and their allies during 1754 to 1763. In the U.S. we call this the French and Indian War, which actually ignited the worldwide struggle. Given the brutal nature of the conflict, many Americans felt bitterness and distrustful of France. Great Britain eventually triumphed in the war by 1763. This left the French with a burning desire for vengeance. France saw their chance when the American colonists launched the American Revolution. When the French concluded that the Patriots could win in 1778, they signed a military alliance and declared war on Britain in order to weaken the British Empire. Charles de Montesquieu and the title page of his Spirit of the Laws. Montesquieu's view of humans and nature represents the midpoint between Locke and Hobbes. Montesquieu argued that human society came about from fearful, tentative arrangements to keep the peace among people. In his view, human nature is basically peaceful, but in an ironic twist, Montesquieu blames the institution of society itself for conflict. Once society is created, some promote internal conflict and war so that they can rise in status that they cannot gain in peacetime. Like others before him, Montesquieu argues that self-preservation is a fundamental law of human nature. Similarly, governments exist to serve its people's interest. However, Montesquieu argues we can never return totally to a state of nature due to human accumulation of knowledge. Montesquieu rejects universal laws of human behavior and argues that a government must be shaped to fit the knowledge and culture of pre-existing society. Human rules only apply to specific times and circumstances. Montesquieu formally describes four different political systems for governance. Despotisms, monarchies, republics, both aristocratic and democratic. Despotism, which is an absolute ruler or a few rulers, represents the most primitive and common form of government. The relationship between the ruler and ruled is governed by fear and terror over the despot's unchecked power. Only religion may temper such a government, especially if that religion promises divine punishment for misbehavior. Degradation of individuals and glorification of the ruler represent this sad society under a despot. Monarchies in a feudal arrangement, for Montesquieu, represent an advance over despotism. Monarchs have mutual obligations with their nobles and commoners, also owe allegiance to both their nobles and kings. France, which has three estates, the clergy, nobles, and commoners, serve to restrain kings from absolute rule. Such a society rests upon several different groups that primarily compete peaceably for honor and prestige in society. The aristocratic republics substitute the rule of oligarchs for kings and nobility. 
A relatively small number of individuals participate in politics as more or less equals. The majority of society, however, has little input. The major advantage of such a government, according to Montesquieu, comes from the fact that the unequal distribution of power mandates that oligarchs must pursue moderate and popular policies. The narrow power base of this republic means it survives only if a large number of people support and benefit from that government's rule. Montesquieu's work then focuses upon democratic republics. Here we see the widespread sharing of political power in these governments. The cost of this government comes from demanding individual interests be sacrificed for those of the community, and from the unity of the people overriding selfish interests of individuals. For this type of government to last, a homogeneous society of citizens must be created. Such a community requires educating people to place societal interests above their own. This type of republic requires citizen service in the militias, laws that promote civil morality and punish immorality, a homogeneous population, little economic inequality, and a compact size. A stable democratic republic is relatively stagnant, in his view, as this is the cost for this form of government. Individual pursuits of money, honor, self-interest, immorality, and consumption must be discouraged by the state. Diversity among the individuals and their self-interest causes civil strife and results in political upheaval. Next, Montesquieu compares and contrasts monarchies and democratic republics. Democratic republics require a virtuous citizenry, little diversity, and placement of societal desires over that of individuals. Societal conformity results in a stagnant but stable society. Monarchies, on the other hand, encourage individual achievement and honor, but this often causes corruption among the subjects. Emphasis on individual competition and honor instead of the interest of society, and widespread poverty in a society by discouraging economic growth. In the world during the 1740s, Montesquieu finds Great Britain most closely represents his ideal system. There is significant participation by citizens and governance through juries, elections, and parliament, and these broaden citizen interests beyond self. Competition in making money rather than honor among English nobility promotes economic growth. The king's executive powers over the military, judiciary, and bureaucracy promotes stable governance. Finally, competition in society between different power bases for recognition money, and honors creates a more open society based on merit. Capitalism, as practiced by the English, promotes good government, according to Montesquieu. The values of capitalism allow cultural diversity, greater societal wealth, and reduce the emphasis on honor by emphasizing peaceful competition over money instead. Capitalism also requires a strong work ethic, discourages consumption, and promotes moderation, which tempers individuals' desires for absolute power or religious conformity. One does not argue nor desire to harm one's customers if you want to make money. Montesquieu's influence was deeply felt by those drafting the American constitutions after the Revolution. John Adams and most of the other framers tried to ensure the design of American government would fit the circumstances and experiences of Americans rather than serve as a universal template for governance. This is in accordance with Montesquieu. Similarly, the Federalist Papers propose that only a strong central government with limited powers can effectively protect society against all enemies, foreign and domestic. However, at the same time, divided powers and checks of these powers will keep the government from oppressing its citizens. In another example, Montesquieu's idea of anarchy at the international level is echoed in George Washington's farewell address. Washington argues the American government must pursue the interest of its citizens over that of other nations because that is the duty of a government to its citizens. Restoring a monarchy after successfully revolting against a king was a non-starter in America. 
Thus, constitutional debates dealt with deciding exactly how democratic versus aristocratic the new American Republic would be. Hamilton favored a more aristocratic republic with limited franchise and a strong central government. For him, like Montesquieu, the British system was worth copying. Jefferson, on the other hand, wanted a more pastoral democratic republic that broadened political participation and protected its citizens from corruption. Hamilton and Jefferson's arguments in their state papers over the creation of the Bank of the United States reflects these sentiments as well as debates between Hamilton and others at the Constitutional Conventions. Americans adopted Montesquieu's doctrine on the separation of powers wholesale through creating three equal branches of government, the selection mechanism for each branch's officials, differing terms in office, bicameralism, checks and balances against each other branch's power, and the retention of state governments are designed to create a stable mixed government which pursues moderate policies. This mixed government of separate executive, legislative, and judicial branches emulates Montesquieu's romanticized model of the British government. Overall, Montesquieu's impact on American constitutionalism cannot be understated. Framers found his ideas directly relevant to the post-revolution struggles in America when creating new governing institutions. Montesquieu's spirit of the laws was widely accepted by the framers as a guide to how a government of separated powers should operate. Jean-Jacques Rousseau and the title page of his Social Contract. Rousseau argues only a legitimate government, not instituted by force, should have the power to demand obedience to its laws by coercion. Only when a social contract bonds rulers and the ruled in interest can that government legitimately use its powers. All sovereignty rests with the citizens, and citizens determine who may act legitimately in their behalf. Like Montesquieu, Rousseau emphasizes the role of being a good citizen of the community over pursuing individual self-interest. Rousseau's democratic republic emphasizes civic virtue and subjugation of the individual preference by society. Duty and reason will cause citizens to limit their passions and self-interest. Rousseau emphasizes the mystical idea of general will of the populace, which will guide legislators. The people's enduring interest, in Rousseau's formulation, cannot be removed, cannot be fallible or divided, and ultimately will always prove to be just. Rousseau's division of power is that of the legislators who reflect the views of the people in passing laws and those of the executive magistrate or king who executes those laws. Differing from Montesquieu, Rousseau has only three types of government. Democracy, aristocracy, and monarchy. These are distinguished by how widely political power is distributed in society. Many citizens and few magistrates is a democracy. A single ruler and subjects is a monarchy. The aristocracy exists as the midpoint between them in civic participation. Rousseau argues that democracies can only flourish in a small state with little societal wealth. Citizens must share the same interests and passions. These are in accordance with Montesquieu. Rousseau's aristocracies differ mainly on how society's aristocrats are chosen. One form chooses by merit, another type by election, and the last by heredity. Monarchies provide the most suited government for powerful and wealthy states with large populations and area. Like Montesquieu, Rousseau indicates the type of government must fit the history, culture, size, geography, and population of a particular society. A nation governed well attains an increasing population and widespread social prosperity. Bad government ignores laws, promotes private over public interest, and concentrates power in fewer and fewer people, which results in failure. Revolution and replacement of bad government is Rousseau's solution 
and then the people can select a type of government that better fits that society. Rousseau's influence in America primarily affected the views of Americans engaged in political debates during the Washington's administration instead of the creation of U.S. governing institutions. Rousseau's ideas can be seen in the political debates whether the interests of some individuals outweighed those of the majority. Vox Populi, Vox Dei, which translates into the voice of the people is the voice of God, summarizes the Rousseauian ideals of majoritarian government that reflect the general will of the people. Especially in turbulent times, the insistence of the political majority that political minorities must yield on a policy question become widespread. Rousseau's explicit call for revolution in cases of bad governance would seem at first glance to help spur the American Revolution. However, Rousseau's influence in America came later due to historical circumstances. But Rousseau's ideas guided those overthrowing the monarchy in the French Revolution and the subsequent adoption of the Declaration of the Rights of Man. Rousseau's idea of popular sovereignty has been particularly influential at the level of state constitutional development. Many American states revise or even replace their constitutions regularly to reflect the state's general will. Jacksonian democracy and other popular movements can be viewed, in part, as American responses to Rousseau's ideas. Text sources. These are sources for images and media. Additional information can be found at these websites. This concludes this content module.